All right. Welcome to Ordinary Voices uh, session, information session. Just in case you are wondering, this is a very honest and a genuine discussion regarding this finance bill 2023, Kenya. So the first question I'm tempted to ask, I happen not to be a priest and I happen not to be a financial analyst by any means, but this is the first question. Whoever can be trusted with small things can also be trusted with big things. And whoever is dishonest in little things will also be dishonest in big things. So as a country or as a government, do you think we are currently using or putting into good use what we already have as a country? Maybe something to think about. But for you who is out there and wondering, who is this going to talk to us about the finance bill 2023? Well, my name, call me Peter if you do like, and I'll just share my turn my camera on so you see me. Call me Peter if you do like. Back in 2016, just a bit of a glimpse, I thought I wanted to be a president of this country by 2027. And then a lot have changed. I no longer want to be a president because I've learned or I've figured out what I actually want to do. So in this particular episode, I'm tempted to address you as a president of the Republic of Kenya, if you see what I mean. So probably this is targeted towards the citizens of Kenyans, because if I'm a president, I'm addressing the people of the country. So this is probably targeted to the people of Kenya. Some of us who are the ordinary voices, that we have ideas, we have thoughts, but purely not so many people make it to the mainstream media or we get our views asked. But I've done a few interviews out there to collect ideas, to collect thoughts about this finance bill 2023 and how it is going to impact the general population, including the high end, the low end, and the ones we call the mamamboga, if you see what I mean, and the border borders of this world. And probably that's why I'm here today. So at the end of this discussion, I might tell you what I've discovered or my area of interest, where I want to lead, and probably why I no longer want to be the president of this particular republic. So let's get back into this small presentation that I did have for you today. So I did ask, how are we spending what we already have to get what we want as a country? So maybe start thinking around that line. But currently, we have the UDA telling us, kazi ni kazi, and now we have a new bill being proposed. And we have the Azimio, la umoja, one Kenya coalition party, with mandamanos going on, and with a lot of things going on. And now we have a finance bill being proposed. So the Mandamano team are telling us, oh, our MPs will go and vote against this, this bill. This other team, obviously they have the numbers. They are telling us these are the things we want. And the other time I saw the, the, the prime cabinet, uh, leader, Musalia Mudavadi, tell us that we give solutions. They've just given us what they have. How about us giving solutions? I hope and believe that probably by any means this content reaches his desk or someone's desk just to hear the ordinary voices talk and share their thoughts about these things. So I have gone through a few research or few publications about this uh, finance bill 2023. 
And I picked just seven points out of this financial bill. Number one, income tax, which is to be increased from 1% to 3%. So currently we are paying 1%. So it will be going up to 3% if the proposed bill passes. And those who earn above 500,000 to be taxed, approximately 35%. That's number one. And number two, there is a digital asset tax. Those on cryptocurrencies, uh, the digital currencies, member clubs and trade associations. And you've got digital content creators, which will now be taxed from zero to 15% tax. And you've got house levy deductions of 3%. And the VAT on the petroleum product, which will go from 8% to 16%. And finally, you have excise duty, not, not, not um, the final one. This is the second last one. Excise duty, going gaming, betting, lottery, attracting 20% from 7% that they are being taxed now. And mobile money transfer, attracting 12%. And then finally, we got a tax appeal tribunal where you have to deposit 20% of the tax in dispute. So this is just a summary of what the current finance bill is proposing. It's still a proposal, nothing, nothing yet on law, but it is still a proposal. But if this passes, how will it affect the common man or the ordinary voices we speak about? me, you, and anyone out there. So let us have a look at statistics. I also went a little bit deeper to do a bit of research. And I did ask myself, or I saw under Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission, which says Kenyans, according to the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission, Kenya is losing an estimated 608 billion billion Kenya shillings to corruption annually. So how is the current government telling us or how are they dealing with this one? Imagine if as a country we save 608 billion Kenya shillings in a year, where will that money go? Will it help us evade all the taxes or will it help our economy grow? and do other things. What is government doing around that? And what as people are we doing towards helping the government fight corruption? I just wanted to post that a little bit out there for you to think as we dive more in into this conversation. Now, I did a bit of a research and I had a chat with a citizen of the British and he said, the Kenyan MP, this is in additional to this research that I'm going to, to share right now. But he says a Kenyan MP is paid probably two times a UK MP who spends 270 days in parliament, defending their people, fighting for this uh, people's rights, doing a lot of stuff. So he said Kenyan MP, obviously most of which Sometimes we go into parliament and we see the seats are empty. They are all over the place, running their businesses and doing a lot of things. And Kenyans MP are paid twice the amount. Maybe a lawyer or somebody in the house can tell me how many days or statutory days are required for an MP to be in parliament. And you can imagine that. And they are the highestly paid, according to these statistics, this was on the daily, daily news that they are the among us, the top paid MPs around the world. And now if our MPs are among the top paid MPs around the world and Kenya is just a developing countries, where does that put us? I just wanted to post that out there for you to start thinking and ask yourself, are this MP worth paying that amount of money or are we in a position to probably reduce the MP salary and put that money into some good use. Maybe something to think about. And when I was talking to this guy, he did say 
that you go into parliament and you see pubs and you see all these drinks and you see all this, which MPs enjoy at, at the taxpayers' expense. In Britain, if you go into a parliament and you go into these pubs and you drink and you have guests and you have visitors, a bill will be sent to you within a week and you have to pay that bill. For us Kenyans, they go drink, they go have fun, they do their things, they don't serve the people and they are still the top paid MPs around the world. How do we want to actually grow our economy if we are paying people a lot of money and they are doing things that do not move the needle for the country. Well, I did say I wanted to, to be a president at the beginning of this conversation. And I did say that dream has changed and I'm doing other things in other, in other areas that I think more, more related to, to, to these things. So probably that um, might paint a picture why I'm passionate about these topics or these things I'm talking about. This is just to give you another angle of looking at things. Let us look at, at unemployment across Kenya. They say in a country of 28 million people actively looking for work, 10.1 million are out of employment. And we are speaking about taxing people. Who are we going to tax? Are we going to tax these people who are out of employment or people who are in employment and earning, earning little money? Again, this is tying just a little bit to highly paid MPs, unemployed people, and then finally, we are talking about the UDA and the Azimio. Well, the UDA is putting some proposal on the table. What is the opposition telling us? Are they giving us possible solutions or are we just talking about mandamanos or are we just going out there to, to confuse people more? In my thoughts, I was thinking, how about the Azimio team approach this in a soberly mind and just like to think, well, the government you are proposing this, how about looking at this and then coming into a conclusion on various ways to solve these issues? Will the mandamanos of this world help us? Will the fights and podium dances help us solve these issues? Well, in this particular segment or discussion, I just got few points following an engagement with few members of the ordinary voices like me and you who might be interested in this. Probably those even who don't understand this English, maybe they listen to Swahili more. Maybe I will produce another episode in Swahili, but purely this is for a group who can actually understand how things work and probably, probably share their views in relation to all these things. So, Let's dive right in into the income tax, which currently members are being taxed 1%. And a proposed or a proposal to tax 35% of those earning beyond 500,000 500, Kenya shillings. So I did start by asking myself these two questions. Is the government going to tax the same salary or the employers are going to increase the salaries? Then are we, use, are we using well what we already collect? Yes or no? And if the government is going to tax the same salary, for example, that we are earning now or those who are working, some of us don't have even job. If you are going to tax what we already have at all those subjects to task, then meaning we will just be working for the government we won't have money to pay rent. We won't have money for food. We won't have money to like look after ourselves, meaning we will go deep into poverty. Is that what the government want for its people? Maybe something to start thinking about. So as an individual and the group or representing the ordinary voices, we did have a proposal or suggestion. So the first one was, how can people be empowered to earn more fast? then contribute to the tax or generate more money into the economy. Can we engage the people to find out more about that? Then how to do it, for example, this team suggested that have a honest country business and employment forums to hear from key stakeholders. How can they empower more people? 
to earn more income, build more, and then contribute towards the building the economy. And this is good for 35% tax for people earning about 500,000 Kenya shillings. <laughs> if Kenyans, the highest person is earning, for example, talk about the youth and so many other people. If you earn 60,000 or 50,000, you, you are among the lucky people. So this won't affect you much. But currently, tell us, when I was engaging this particular person, he did say, that if the top 2,000 wealthy people in Kenya just pay 3% income tax on their asset, in two months, 186,000 new jobs will be created in the medical and educational professional. This was according to some report on the Auditor General. So the big question to ask ourselves is, are these top 2,000 people currently paying their tax? If they are, where are their tax going? If they are not, why are they not paying their taxes? And should we tax the common man or should we tax people earning a lot of income? Now, let's get on to this number two, the digital tax, the cryptocurrencies, the trade union and the clubs and the associations. So the first questions we ask ourselves was, who, member clubs and the association, who are these, what are these trade unions and clubs doing? What needs taxing and what needs support? Do we need such member clubs and association and what for? What are these digital currencies? Are they being taxed already, for example? So we ask ourselves about this. And when they say that the members on that bill, I did saw some good insights. For example, membership fees won't be taxed and other few things won't be taxed. But if they indulge into businesses, then they pay those taxes. That was, that was really good. But the bigger thing is, what are these current, what are the current status of these associations, the trade unions? What are they doing currently? So this doesn't affect much of the common man or the ordinary voices, but I think in a way, the trade unions and all the other stakeholders involved need to be involved in a discussion to see how best can we contribute to the growth of the economy of Kenya to create more income or to support more people get into employment so that they can pay the minimum tax they can so that the country can grow. Now, Digital tax. And I see a lot of engagement on this one because it is it touches on much of the digital influencers and so many people online. And that's like what we see going around. And here is now their focus. Not so many of us even have this internet. Not all of us have these digital tools to do what, what we, we do today. But why, why this conversation? So we ask ourselves these three questions. Is the government empowering these content creators to be effective and to enable them earn more money? What national resources are they using to justify that they need to pay 15% tax from a non-paying tax, for example? Are the government free Wi-Fi? Because the other day I saw free Wi-Fi is being launched all over the place. I don't know if those Wi-Fi's are working, but the research I've done, none of them. None of those Wi-Fi spots, <laughs> hot spots are working. I think they're just PR here and there to, to see like, to make people feel like they're doing something. So the Ordinary Voices proposed, or the group I talked to proposed that, how about building infrastructure for the content creators, i.e. most of them use internet. How could we bring that down and support them? And then, how about establishing content creation hubs in all the 47 counties with the 21st century equipment and then tax people who go to use or ask people who go to use these facilities to pay for these particular services. And then that money they pay can go to support the government issues rather than taxing people who use their own equipment, pay their own, own data, use their own machines, struggle with their own power and just, 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 just hustle to make ends meet. 
then create more content creators to earn more money and more to generate more money into the economy. Ask these who are already dominating the field to empower more content creators so we can have more and more money buying things and then paying, paying, paying for these taxes through the things they buy and then the money can circulate in the economy. How about doing that? As opposed just to coming from nowhere and then you are like, you are taxing people 15%. It is like the parable of, I don't know, the, 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 the talents where another one kept their talent under a bed, another one grew their talent and another one grew, another one doubled the talent. So then you just come and you say, hey, we want this money. Did you work for the money? Just like they say, you cannot reap where you did not sow. So that's just my suggestion along this particular asset, uh, digital asset tax, for example. And then we are coming into the house levy deductions of 3% for anyone who is working or anyone who is employed. Again, the first question was, are we still going to tax the same salary? or the employers are going to increase the salaries for people that they employ before we, we, we deduct the 3% salary, 3% tax from all these um, earnings. So the three questions here were, what is the process of doing this? Because I hear that people are already having homes and that people don't, have, don't want to have homes. We want to live on trees as ordinary voices. And that people, we don't want the houses because at the end of the day, some of us will say, well, I'll leave the earth and I don't need a house. I can rent one or I can Airbnb and B and I'm, I'm just going, okay? So what's the process of doing this? Are we going to tax those who already have their houses or uh, those who don't want to be part of this? What is the process like? Then who needs this and who does not need it? How are we going to identify them? And how are we going to, to to see how the deductions are done. Then again, will there be an increase in salary? Or we are just going still to tax the same salary or the same common man, uh, suffering common man in our community? Those were some of the three questions this team discussed. And then they came up with a, with a suggestion. So how about a government approaching this differently and saying, as a government, we want to set a goal. And by 2025, we want to eradicate slums in Kibra, Kibra constituency. And to do this, we need approximately 10 billion to eradicate the slums in Kibra. And we welcome citizens to contribute towards this. And this is our, they are like government can create a donation page, can do a lot of things. And every single month, you have a fundraising event to raise the money to go towards this eradication of slums in Kenya. How about that one? Because if you force people to do things, they will not. In fact, they will find ways to go around it. Just like we, we have always seen people earning a lot of money and they find ways and reasons in order to, to pay taxes. And just the other day, the president was saying, <laughs> the KRA team and other members are colluding with other people who are evading tax, not to pay tax. So you pay the, the officials from KRA and then you, you find your way out. How about finding ways to incentivize and come up with a proposal that will lure more people to want to donate as opposed to forcing them to, to uh, deducting their money that they've worked for and sending them back to poverty. And then how about the government of Kenya working to get people out of poverty into work? And once they get into work, they can earn more money and they can build their own homes. And when I was seeing this, this proposal, it is like you just collect the money for seven years and then you then now start deciding who will now get this money. And I'm like, well, you deduct my money for seven years. What if I don't get or I don't qualify to be given a house? You refund my money. And what is the procedure of refunding my money? Mm, how does this look like? I got confused in there and that's what the team decided to, to share. Then how about the government using their global or the international or the local networks to raise money to support this housing project and housing levy and get more people to, like say in a year you get 10 people out of slums, the other year you get 20 people, the other year you get 50 and you bring stakeholders. I see people meeting 
in in, in state house talking about things i see bikes being donated at at, at, a, at a cost of 273 million and so many other things happening how about if this is a priority how about hosting a fundraising event and bringing this wealthy wealthy kenyans or wealthy friends of kenyans to help raise capital so that we can eradicate slums in kenya and get more people into a good housing so then this brought us into the VAT and a petroleum product, which now will be taxed uh, at 16% from 8%. And you can actually tell how much this will impact the common man. And here now is where the ordinary voices all seen. People like me who, who like ride border borders, people like me who, who just move around and um, use fuel. And the clients I was listening to some some conversations <laughs> when a client you used to take somewhere at a cost of 50 Kenya shillings and the prices have gone up, now you need to charge them say 100 or 150. They will not pay that money. They want costs reduced. So as a border border person like Peter, I'm kicked out of business, all right? So how, what can we do as people to support these border border people like me, for example? So the questions we ask, how will this impact the supply chain? from the production to the end user? Will it increase the cost of living? And if it does increase the cost of living, again, we are still taxing this man the same salary or the same money they used to earn. Where will this put them back into poverty? And then what will this achieve at the end of the day if we increase the VAT on petroleum products from eight to 16? What will we achieve is increase the cost of living, but still people earn the same or do, do the same things. So we got a little bit confused and we wanted to find some, maybe if this gets into the desk of those key decision makers, just like our aim with ordinary voices to pass our message using the available tools to these people. So they can start thinking around that. So we had a proposal over there. So we, we came to a conclusion and said, engage with the stakeholders in the field to find ways to handle this. I.e. if we ask these stakeholders in the petroleum industry, how can we retain the tax rate now at eight and still meet the needs of the people? What can we do, for example? What can we do to keep this constant but still serve the people so that the stressed common man is not stressed more in terms of fuel, in terms of this border border people like me, and we can still make income, we can still live a well, a sustainable life. And then the team also say tax is not everything. We as a government or the, the leaders in the government need to find incentives for people to live sustainably. Because if I pay all my, my money to the government, how will I live every single day? I'm just working for government. Who will look after my children? Who will pay my, my food? Who will? So a lot of things there. So it's not about task, tax, as the team say. It is much of empowering people to do things and to support their own and see that they can thrive. And then we came into excise duty, gaming, betting, and lottery now attracting 20% from 7.5% tax. And the money transfer, you guys know about M-Pesas of this world, now going to be taxed around another 12%. Oh, okay. We say this was really nice, but then we asked ourselves again this question. How much is generated by these sectors of gaming, betting, and then the lottery? Maybe. Do we really need the gaming industry? Do we really need the betting industry? Do we really need all these things that we want to tax? We're just thinking about tax, 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 tax. How about thinking of, how about we change the conversation and say, how about thinking, making of an impact and empowering the people so that they can make the change and make their lives much easier and interesting. So we thought about that. So why should we be taxed 20%, for example? betting and gaming and all that from just zero. Where is this money coming from? And these people playing these games, where are they getting the money? And these people running these gaming companies, where are they getting the money from? Is this their money already being taxed? If yes, how can we work with them to drive more impact? If we had suggestions. How can the gaming industry be, be grown for good? I.e. capital raised personally, just like that. I do football and I love sports. 
how can these gaming industries, or for example, betting companies, which make the amount of money, how about supporting them to establish community sports activities or gaming hubs in all the 47 counties? And these gaming hubs can be used to train more people to create more gamings, to create more sports, to create more challenges to the community and create employment in all these country, counties. And when these employment are created, then people can live better lives and contribute money to the economy. Rather than taxing them and the government use gets the money, the money gets looted and nothing changes. How about incentivizing these gaming industries and companies to invest in the counties so that they can have their own situations or changes in their own way at the community level where they impact real change at the grassroots level to create better life for all. And then the second one, probably the government can say we want to ban betting in all its form and probably invest on real activities, for example, agriculture, technology that will improve on agriculture and get people to really work and not culture, build this culture of the free things. I'll just sit somewhere with my phone. I'll just bet I will get money and then life is that. How about just banning it, for example, and get people to work on creating food, protecting the environment, peace building and stability across the country. The more we think about tax and not think about the impact of this tax and things, the country might plunge into more issues and so many other things. And then tax appeal, this is probably the, the final or the, the final one before we, we, we gave our final conclusion on this particular subject. So the tax appeal, it says, if you are taken to a tax tribunal or a court and you have a bit, two or one million tax to pay, then you have to deposit 20% of this, of this tax in dispute. As things stand now, you know how corruption, you know how accountability, integrity, and so many things are in question around this country called Kenya. Will this tax appeal tribunal be made of honest people, genuine people, accountable people, that people can't go around them and just pay, hey, you have this 50,000 and get my file lost or something like that? Will they be able to deliver? So the questions we ask, do we really need tax appeal tribunal? Maybe we need to ask ourselves, who will, who will pay them and how much will they be paid? Will they be, be paid less so they will collude with people to evade more tax or how will these things work? We needed to find more about that. So along the suggestions on this tax tribunal, change the people's mindset, for example, by ensuring that what is already being given is well used. So we don't, have, we don't even sometimes need the tribunal. We just need to work on the mindset of people by convincing them that you gave us this much, we've used this much here, and this was the deficit. Like currently, Kenya is generating 4 billion or 3 trillion. And this 3, 3 trillion, we are using it here, and we have a deficit of 1 trillion. What can we do to generate the 1 trillion that we are missing? And people can actually see results. And when they see results and good life, obviously they will be more attracted to pay the taxes. And then educate people and work with them in the process. This is what we are struggling with. Can we have ideas? Listen to them, just genuinely listen to them. And then finally, be transparent and accountable as a government to get people buy in. If you say you are going to have a um, people engagement, please do have a genuine people engagement, not a pre-decided uh, engagement. Have people have their say, look at them critically and take the ideas and suggestions that will actually move the needle for the country. And finally, we got a conclusion. They're like five steps. Let us engage the people and genuinely listen to what they have to say. Secondly, let the government and the people be honest and open about things. Honesty and openness about things. And then let us deal with the right things, i.e. end corruption, and then move on to the next thing, one thing at a time, and then get results and then move on to the next one. And then the members of parliament, they serve fast and not, they, they, they need to serve the people who elected them and not themselves. So here we talked about the selfish interest, put people first and then your needs will follow in. 
Because when they are elected into the government, first thing, they're talking about their salaries. Who is talking about the salaries of ordinary voices? People who are not employed, people who are struggling. And then finally, empower people to earn more, then ask for more by just being realistic about things. To conclude, listen to the people on the ground. They have all the solutions in the world. That is according to Baka Roy. So I hope this reaches the common man out there and the leaders and those who are looking to take Kenya to the next level. I hope to connect, I hope to share more as we move along. And about the finance bill, let's think and let's represent the interest of the people. With that, we say thank you.